got a degree at, at BYU. Uh -huh. I work for the Farm Service Agency, uh -huh. uh, part of a department of USDA. Because of that job, uh, Liz and I moved home. We said if it doesn't work in five years, we could always leave. Oh, that's great. And then we, uh, our family was born and lived here, and we're still here looking at the end of a five-year period. Oh, that's true. <laughs> but <clears throat> a history, as far as, as growing up here, uh, the property where we live was part of the fields. All of the vacant lots were held in very strong hands, and Bicknell didn't grow at all. People just, uh, they didn't want any growth. Yeah. And those properties, vacant properties, were held. Uh, Meeks Morell decided that he would solve that problem and subdivided the, the northern part of his field, and uh, my father bought uh, two lots here, but just as soon as they were for sale, and we moved back, and he gave us a lot, and we built our home here, and, oh, nice. and here we are. Mm -hmm. uh, high school, uh, the old building, the old high school building, oh, I, I was built in the 20s, attended their elementary school. Each town uh, had a historically back in the 40s and 50s, each town had their elementary school. Then they consolidated and brought them to two schools, one in Loa and one in Bicknell. <clears throat> when I was in eighth grade, the school district put all of the kids together in one elementary school in Loa, created a middle school, and then a high school. Middle school, high school was here in Bicknell. Oh, that's good. So, grew up with the, or attended school the, my older brother's uh, 12 years older than I am, oldest brother Jeff, next brother David, uh, seven years older than I am. I, I remember the day as a senior in high school, one teacher was a little upset with some shenanigan I was engaged in, and, <laughs> and she cussed me that I acted just like my oldest brother. And I was in trouble for something my oldest brother had done. <laughs> Some teacher's memory went on a long time. Twelve years, that is Twelve long years, time. she, <laughs> something had offended her. Wow. But I grew up on the, uh, working on the farm, uh, going to school. Uh, the work on the farm was always an adventure for me. I always enjoyed it. I worked really close with my father, Ralph Pace. So was it a cattle ranch? Yes, it was a cattle ranch. Uh, my grandfather had uh, cattle. Uh, the markets collapsed, had a terrible winter, the banks financed him, he went into the sheep business. This was 1914, 1913. Oh, wow. And when he finished up, he had 3,000 ewes. Mm. World War II rolled around and was unable to find help. So he pretty much sold out, held on to some property so that when Dad got home from the war, he was able to go into the cow business. And what was that grandfather's name? Vern Willard Pace. Vern Willard Pace. And, uh, so was he also the ancestor of Guy Pace? No. Then? No. It goes back Guy's father and Vern's father were brothers. Oh my gosh. So your family has such strong roots here. Go back a long time. Wow. Our, our third great grandmother. Uh, left uh, the Silver Reef Mine, uh, part of Washington, uh, came to uh, Rabbit Valley, uh -huh. Wayne County. It was the last of the prop available land here at 7,000 feet who wanted to come here to farm. Wow. No one did. Right. Here in the Uinta Basin were the last areas settled in the state. Hmm. People came here to start over, really. Mm -hmm burned out, starved out, divorced out, whatever, they could come here and attempt to start over. Hmm. I, I find that that spirit of starting over still exists. Oh, really? Yes, people come here to start over. Interesting. It's, yeah, it's quite a, it's a hard place to live. Mm -hmm. But I always say it's a hard place to live, but an incredible place to have trouble. <laughs> 
people rally around and they take care of each other and that uh, that spirit of oneness of family exists through all of the communities. People laugh and joke. If you ask a native uh, resident of the county, where are you from? The standard answer is Wayne County. Mm -hmm. We won't say the town. Rarely would you hear someone say Bicknell or Lower Lyman. First they'd say Wayne County. And everyone gets a big joke out of that and laughs, but we're one high school, Wayne High. Yeah. Even <clears throat> the kids in Hanksville. So the whole county is a unique setting. We all go to one high school. So through that process, we, we blend, we become mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. So yes, we're from Wayne County. Then the, the next definition is that which town are you from? And Wayne County is a close-knit community. Yes, it is. It is. There are way fewer residents now than there were in the early 40s. Hmm. And why is that? Well, well, you used to could raise a family on a 40-acre piece of land. It was a subsistence existence, but nonetheless, you could raise your family if you had 40 acres. Uh, mechanization came in, horses went out, you had to have more and more land. There's only a finite amount of, of private land, 2.8% of the county's private. It's that low. I it's that idea. low. Basically, it's, it's a mile to three quarters of a mile either side of the Fremont River as it meanders through. Because that's the waters. That's the water. And water's life. Yeah. We get a total of seven inches of precip annually. Mm. Very high, high 7,000 feet, seven inches of precip. Unusual place. We live in a storm shadow. Mm -hmm. So we're always dry, but we have an incredible reservoir system. Mm. Our forefathers understood that. The reservoirs were constructed and put in place, which you couldn't do now, of course. Mm -hmm. But they were put in place, and it's been a blessing for this valley. Mm -hmm. the, I, I grew up just as the irrigation technology of sprinklers was coming into the valley. About 1964, 63, they brought in the first pressurized sprinkler lines. At one time, there were more acres under sprinkler irrigation in this valley than anywhere in the world. Oh my goodness. Now, there are very few, of course, but the High Line Canal sits high above, is about, oh, three or four hundred feet above uh, most of the fields, so you don't have to pump the water. Oh, I see. Gravity pressurized sprinkler down, and because of that advantage, uh, it was a natural for sprinklers. Mm -hmm. And as that technology took hold, of course, the application rate exceeded way our valley. But So I grew up uh, learning that technology. My older brothers understood the, the canvas dams and the shovel and moving the water. And, but I, didn't, I had very limited experience with that. I had the sprinklers. Mm -hmm. So you'd, you'd change pipes at 6 in the morning and 6 at night. And it looks like that's what people And that's what use. we have today. Yeah. Yes. And it's mostly alfalfa? That's well, grown. at 7,000 feet, so, yeah. you have about 48 frost-free days. Wow. The early varieties of wheat didn't ripen here. Mm -hmm. Wheat would start to ripen just outside of Bicknell and with the Narrows just before Torrey. Mm -hmm. We have shorter season varieties of wheat now, but it, it it was a hard deal to ripen wheat. So wheat was a strategic commodity. You'd trade for it. Ah. Oh. Now I know they had an old mill. The grist mill. Right? It still sits there. And did people grow grain for and have it ground there? Sure. And what kind of grain were they able to grow? Well, wheat. And in, in the lower reaches. And, and, and some, some years you'd be able to ripen your wheat here. Okay. But it was risky. Yeah, you just didn't have long enough growing mm -hmm. season. But 
in maybe towards Tory that's a little lower is is that right where, yeah where yeah. they were able to mm -hmm. grow that okay I see even on the Fremont bench because of the winds that blow mm -hmm. the frost stays off of that so even at a higher elevation but up to Fremont mm -hmm. uh, that area I see was able to ripen wheat mm -hmm. so if you couldn't grow your own wheat you'd trade your beef steers or sheep or whatever nice. and acquire your wheat from the severe, bring it over here and grind it. Mm -hmm. that yeah. Wow. So it's a lot of hard work to live here. Oh, absolutely. Always has been. Though. Always has been. Still is. But people seem to love it. They do. It's a great place to raise a family. That's, yeah. 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 A strong, strong place for that. <laughs> it's hard to keep them here. Mm -hmm. because they have to leave to find employment. Right. So our three sons have gone off to college and mm -hmm. graduated, and mm -hmm. and that's what we've sure. had to see happen. But sure. At least had the experience of growing up on a ranch. Mm -hmm. Now, Liz, what did your dad do when he came back when you were 14? You came yes. back? Yes, yes. Um, we built a home in Loa, and he would just commute to the jobs. He'd go and stay a week at a time and oh, come back. Oh, that's hard. That is hard. But that's that was all he knew. He grew up, his dad had a ranch and cattle, and he didn't love it. Mm -hmm. He loved heavy equipment and that lifestyle, so that's what he... That's what he did his whole life. Did he work for a private construction company he then, or...? Okay. He, he and his brother actually started Brown Brothers Construction in Loa, uh -huh. and then family conflicts, he left and worked all over the state for different oh, companies. Wow. And he died at 54 when he came back. They actually had him come back and help them with some road building that they didn't understand. And so hmm. he was here working for them when he passed away. And only 54? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's young. Yeah, that's young. Heart attack. So. That's... Yeah. So that's that's what I grew up doing, but got to live places like Bullfrog and, you know, Farron when he built I-70 oh. and here. Oh. And Heber. Heber and Salina. And so what year was it when he passed, or approximately? 88. 1988. 88. Yeah. So your mom has been a widow? All she remarried time? briefly, but she, that didn't last long, and she, mm -hmm. so she's been alone. So that is a long time. Mm -hmm. And how old is she now? She'll be 80 this year. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. How great. And so how did you two meet? <laughs> Let's have you tell the story. <laughs> you tell it. I want to hear your version. <laughs> <laughs> we used to drag Maine. <laughs> Gas was cheap, and so you'd drive up and down Main Street, and you'd go right? slow or fast. It didn't matter. <laughs> And there was a turnaround spot at the end of each uh, Main Street. The, you drag Main and Bicknell because that's where the movie theater was. The high school was here. Now that was Highway 24? Highway 24, Main, Main, Main Street. <clears throat> okay. And if you got tired there, you'd go up to Loa okay. and drag Main for a while. <laughs> you didn't do it in the smaller towns. No. No, just Because you only two. had a few blocks. That's right. Right. Uh, I'd returned home from my mission and was logging out on the Boulder Mountain when that was a viable industry. Drag Maine and why there was a carload of girls and we stopped and <laughs> talked and uh, she was barefoot and drinking the red cream soda and, mm -hmm. and she, I could tease her a little bit and she didn't get offended and we talked about it. <laughs> then I had a date with your cousin, we went to Fish Lake, and guess who our waitress was? Liz! Oh my goodness. And it was so much more fun to talk to her than to the girl <laughs> I had the date with, and so that was the last I dated that girl, and we dated, and yeah. was that close to how it happened? Right on. Oh, that's right on. true. It's very nice that you agree on the same version. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> we were married, I finished, uh, a degree at, uh, at BYU, and we we didn't think that we'd come home. That never was in the plan, mm -hmm. but it, it worked out. We had job offers. He had job offers in Michigan, and actually had one in Ecuador. 
Whoa. That's the one I wanted him to take <laughs> for the Benson Institute. And he said, no, you'd never survive down there. I said, you don't know how tough I am. <laughs> and then he got a job offer here. So it just felt natural to come home. That's terrific. Yeah. That's terrific. So you did ranch work plus worked for, you? was it a federal or a state job with the USDA? I still work. Oh, you still. I'm still a county executive director for the Farm Service Agency for uh, Sevier County, Paiute County, and oh, Wayne County. Wow the three county areas. So that's like two full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. <laughs> and you've done that for many years. That's all I know. Wow. She's been so good about it. Ah. <laughs> wow. She didn't know how miserable it was to marry a cowboy. <laughs> Some months of the year it's, it's bad news. but It just takes a lot of time. <clears throat> a lot of time, a lot of commitment to it. And you work for the harshest taskmaster. Mm. Everybody thinks, oh, what a lovely life it would be to be a farmer or a rancher, do whatever you wanted. Well, <clears throat> they don't understand that Mother Nature dictates what you do, and you have to do it within a certain time frame where you've wasted your efforts. You have to plant grain at a certain time, or else mm -hmm. why plant it? Mm -hmm in our harsh climate here. Because you won't have time to harvest. You won't have time to harvest it, so it has to happen when it has mm -hmm. to happen. And Regardless of how cold it is outside. How cold or how much wind. And, mm -hmm. and the, the water, irrigation water needs to be tended. And so Mother Nature, uh, the law of the harvest, uh, we understand early on in our lives that as you sow, so shall you reap. Yeah. But it's been great. I, I, I grew up... Uh, the youngest of three boys, I, I soon had my own horse and saddle and I was just as big as they were and when I was six years old, uh, dad said, well, you can gather the cattle in the spring as the big event down to Hanksville on our mm -hmm. desert range and bring them into the home place and after a, a day or two of just riding half a day, m my mother said, well, Paul needs to go with you all day. Dad said, why? And she said, I just can't have him bawling around here all afternoon. It just isn't, it isn't working. So you just, so I, I grew up doing that. How old would you have been when you went all day on the horse? Six years old. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's very young. This year we took our five-year-old grandson. Oh, six. He didn't do... A full day. He did a half day. Now, do but. you still do brown yes. on the horse? On the horses on the same range that my father acquired in 1915. Wow. So they winter down towards Hanksville. They winter on the Hanksville allotment mm -hmm. okay. on BLM permit. Mm -hmm. And then we bring them to the Bicknell Bottoms here to summer. I uh, had permit on forest permit, uh, I was unable to, 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 to do justice to a mountain permit and a government job, so I sold that. Potential spotted owl habitat and conflicts that I could see arising, I made the choice to sell that. Time will tell whether it played it was a correct oh. decision or not. Okay. But I... We've made it work. We've made it work. Yeah. So where are they in the summer then? On irrigated pasture in the Bicknell Bottoms. Oh. I've taken some hayland, mm -hmm. planted it to grass. Mm -hmm. The Bicknell Bottoms here at 7,000 feet, this valley was where they brought their cattle to spend the summers mm -hmm. from Sevier Valley. Mm -hmm. Went clear up the mountain to Rabbit Jeez. Valley. And so that, this valley is actually ideal for grazing. Okay. Grass grows really well here in short season. Mm -hmm. So I changed the management somewhat, but we still mm -hmm. have the, the winter allotment. We have the part of the, the quarter section of, of the Fairview Ranch that Granddad purchased and then homesteaded and added to it. In fact, on our 35th wedding anniversary, the 5th of the 2nd of May, Oh, nice. This year, 
we pulled a cow out of the quicksand. It's what we <laughs> wow. did for our 35th wedding anniversary. Yeah. Oh, now where was the quicksand? Well, along the Dirty Devil River. The Dirty Devil is just below Hanksville. Okay. The Muddy comes from Emory County, the Fremont from the upper and right just below the town of Hanksville, they combine and become the Dirty Devil. From there to uh, the Colorado, there was a significant storm event, and the river came up, and then as it goes down, <clears throat> the quicksand moves out from this river. I'd ridden the, the area <clears throat> two days prior, told a friend of mine, this when that flood goes down, that'll be quicksand. That's bad. Mm. And two days later, sure enough, there was a cow caught in the quicksand. How did you know that? Do you go out and check them? What? Yes, and I've grown up with quicksand since I was six years so old. So you <laughs> expected it, so you did yes. go check. Yes, I had instructions early on to... Uh, when your horse flounders and gets in the quicksand, you get off behind it. You don't ever get in front of a horse that's thrashing Jeez. around because he'll paw you. But it's not kicking to the rear that would No, hurt because you. they're lunging they're forward, lunging. so they're always going forward, so you just get off behind. Sometimes you'll make a loop in your lariat so that if it's bad conditions, as you step off, you can put that rope over your horse's neck and then be far enough away that you can pull that horse and he won't lunge on you. Now, how do you pull a horse or how did you pull the cow out? It's, it's quite a process to oh. get a cow out of the quicksand. And Cameron, our oldest boy, was with us and our youngest son, Jameson, was there. So I had incredible men that had also grown up. Okay. But the short answer to get one out of the quicksand, you, you dig down, they go down through, and they'll actually punch a hole in the layers of water that hold the sand in suspension. And as they punch a hole, then that water goes out and the sand just holds cement. on to the cement right around oh them. So, so you dig down, get one leg free, and you tie it up. So you tie all of their legs up, and then you can roll them over like a, like a log. And then we put three horses onto her and pulled her about eight feet, and she was out of it. Oh my gosh. All of that process that I described there, three hour project. Oh, in the mud. In the mud. Now, while you're digging <clears throat> that cow's leg, are you not sinking in the... Oh, sure you are. And how do you keep from you getting trapped? And Well, because <clears throat> you just keep moving. Okay. You don't just stand there. And you're able to think a little more clearly mm. than the cow is. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. You know how to yes. maneuver. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh, how scary, though. So, I, I grew up dealing with the quicksand along the, the Dirty Devil River. We have a picture of a horse stuck in the quicksand in here on the wall. And uh, learning how to handle those circumstances. Because when animals feel fret threatened and panic, that's really dangerous. Well, that's why you give a horse some room. They'll thrash and, and they'll they'll try to use you to come up out of the quicksand. Right. It's every man for himself. That's right. And a, and a horse stops thinking. <laughs> Sometimes they'll give up and, and just lay down and die. Mm. Just lay down and drown. So mm. you, it, you, it's quite a process. You never enter. When you need to cross the river, you make sure that you know where you're going to get out on the other side. A lot of people say, oh, this is a trail in, and then they're trapped. How do you get out? Mm -hmm. You soon learn that you pick your spot to come out. Then you go into the river. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the cows? Are they pretty dangerous, too, she while you're seemed, tying legs? and She seemed to really have an understanding that they were there to help. That was lucky. That was lucky. Plus, she was exhausted. That helps. She'd been too. there two days. She'd been there two days, so she was... She was exhausted. Oh, so too tired to... And she really needed a drink. She was four feet away from water, but nonetheless, she couldn't 
get any water. So she would have died. Oh that yes, another close. 12 hours we wouldn't have saved her. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, how scary. That's, that's a typical spring roundup. <laughs> and what a way to celebrate your anniversary. <laughs> yes. I know. Oh, gosh. <laughs> now do they call the area where you go the South Desert? No. It's no. further north of Hanksville and right. west maybe. Yes. But you're... We're on the Hanksville allotment. Okay. That's a different spot. That's a different allotment. Yes. And is that Dirty Devil River the water source for the winter for the cows? Then? Part of it. A lot of my cows will drink there. Mm -hmm. We have uh, uh, wells. Oh, okay. You do uh, have... We, we've taken the opportunity and, and, and put submersible solar powered submersible pumps in a, in existing wells uh, the oil companies went through that looking for uh, well they started to look for uranium and some of petroleum so we'll find the wells that go down into the Navajo formation and then we just pump the water out oh it's great and how great to have solar powered uh, solar pumps. works well wonderful and uh, we have some that a 480 foot lift that we still have to uh, power with a diesel generator. Mm -hmm. But it's changed the whole dynamic of the range. We were able to put cattle and, and uh, wildlife or, or in different or places where they never used to be because of the water we've developed. I see. I see. It makes sense, yeah. And so it, it's, it's really enhanced mm -hmm. the, the range management and the operation, and, and the range is in a lot better shape. So they benefit the deer, they benefit, That's there's right. antelope on that range, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, sure, they all, they all, it makes it more accessible to all of them. Mm -hmm. So in your uh, working adult life, have you ranched mostly cattle, not sheep? Well, I've always had a sheep herd. Oh. I always have 50 to 60 head. Just so that you know you don't want any more than that. <laughs> Dad says, always keep a few sheep around. And, and it's a good dynamic um, as far as uh, weed control. It also helps on the cash flow. Uh, you, you sell lambs earlier in the fall when you need water for water assessments and land taxes. You have a lamb crop to sell. I see. So that's part of the management of the cash flow. In a sense, you've got a diversified portfolio. That's right. <laughs> yes. Then we sell the wool in the spring. Mm -hmm. Great. Great system. So in, in this valley, they used to have uh, Nelson Ricks had the creamery and they uh, had made cheese. So they had dairy cows? Had dairy cows here. It oh. was it was <clears throat> perfect for families to have five or six dairy cows. Mm -hmm. You'd milk by hand. Wow. But that was just a little bit of cash coming in mm -hmm. every two weeks. Mm -hmm. Made a huge difference mm -hmm. in the survival of, of families in this valley. Lifestyles were very different. Then. That's were, why you could survive raising a family on 40 acres. Yeah. Very simple lifestyle. Very. Yes. Bartered a lot of things. Oh my gosh. But now you have primarily beef cattle. Correct. Yes. You do. Oh wow. Well, it certainly keeps you busy then, it, huh? Well, it does. <laughs> but it's a good lifestyle. Everything has a trade-off. Right. Right. And, and for the advantages it gives, you do have to pay a price. Mm -hmm. There's an entry fee in most contests. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. That's good and comparison. It's an addiction. I've grown up doing it, and uh, it, it was good for our sons to understand that, mm -hmm. to get the work done first, and then play. They learned a work ethic, huh? Yes, they did. And in our family, we've learned we have one gear it's high gear. You work hard and you play hard. That's Whatever you do, you give it all the energy you've got. That's great. That's and great. Uh, and even though they they don't live here and may not ever, they've all said you can't ever sell the ranch, Dad. They ever. love it. They do. They do. They love it. Yeah. 
Now, most of your married life have been a homemaker, Liz. How many years did you run on the volunteer ambulance? I was an EMT on a volunteer ambulance for 20. Oh, wow. 20 years. Um, I managed the pool here for 10 years. All our sons learned to swim and the whole family got certified scuba. Wow. Even the old dad that's a non-swimmer, oh. <laughs> I'm certified scuba. That's impressive. Yeah. That's impressive. I did home health for a few years with my EMT certification, um, CNA. Um, I worked for 12 years for a local wilderness program. Oh, we worked was it with Al the, Alpine? Aspen. 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 That's yes. right. Aspen. Yes, I did. I was a field medic and then I worked in the office and then finally as an admissions counselor. Mm -hmm. So I did that for 12 years. Done lots of things. Currently I'm working as a pastry chef. And I also do wedding cakes on the side. I, I did a little bit of schooling too. That is a phenomenal range <laughs> of talents. She can do anything. I'll say. That's terrific. I love to sew. I have winters off, so I love oh, to make quilts. Oh, that's great. How yeah. great. There's, there's a story I want to talk about okay. uh, relevant to her uh, as an EMT. Mm -hmm. We were sitting down for Mother's Day dinner. My dad's birthday and Mother's Day occasionally would fall on the same day. May 10th. May 10th. Mother's birthday and Father's Day would fall on the same day. June 19th. June 19th. Oh. So. We sat down, uh, the pager went off, there had been a, a terrible wreck out on the road going towards the top of the Boulder Mountain. A Suburban had just was going way too fast and had rolled and scattered people out and mm. was left to, to take care of it. <clears throat> and uh, they brought in a helicopter, mm -hmm. didn't you, mm. to, to move people out. Uh, and in talking to these individuals, uh, I asked, them, why are you here? And they said, well, we are environmental attorneys. And we are here documenting the fact that this country is overgrazed, that nothing is growing here. <laughs> oh, dear. And I said, well, what elevation do you think you're at? He was a driver also on our ambulance for 12 years. Oh, okay. As, a, as well as an EMT. Yeah, I've tried the EMT. He certified for oh, wow. part of that time as well. Wow. And they had no idea the elevation they were at. At 8,500 feet, nothing grows on the 10th of May. It's still winter. <laughs> and uh, I thought, wow, this is, this is what we're dealing with. Mm. And I, I asked them, what's the precip zone? Oh, well, there, there at least has to be 25, 30 inches of rain at this elevation. I said, try seven and a half oh, inches. Oh, my goodness. And over the last 10 years, it's more like six and a half. They didn't you know, understand this they area They didn't understand. At all. But they were here. And, and I said, well, it, it's an interesting uh, place that we're at right here. All these ranchers that are gathering up this terrible wreck that you've created are the very people that you want to have move out of here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we're not here, who's going to help you in your wreck? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there was complete silence. They did not understand that. They were not in a position to argue. <laughs> no, no. Very true. Oh my goodness. And so it's... Uh, People talk about tourism, that's fine, we need it. There aren't many motel rooms full here on the 10th of January. No. No, it's non-existent. Everything closes. Everything closes. So what's the industry that's still feeding money through this mm -hmm. community? It's agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't understand the multiplier effect of agriculture dollars. Mm -hmm. Agriculture, uh, mining, and manufacturing are the highest multipliers. Tourism is very low. Mm -hmm. Service industries are, are very low, 1.3 turnover. When you say multiplier effect, give an example of that. That's the time that the dollars will turn over in the community. Oh. So for every agriculture dollar infused into an economy, it will roll over as many as 2.8 times. I see. A tourism dollar that's infused 
will go over 1.2 times. I didn't realize that. And so in your economies, you need to have a mix. You need mm -hmm. to have the variety. Mm -hmm. It would be nice to have manufacturing. Mining is the very best thing that you can have. Agriculture, tourism. Mm. There should be all of it. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. A conflict exists in the valley because of the limited resource private land. 2.8%. The balance belongs to BLM, Forest Service, Park Service, entities that have very little skin in the game. I, I always compare it to two farm animals talking about breakfast. <laughs> you have a chicken and a pig who contributes the most. Right. And uh, we are the pig because our life, when they yeah. take something from us, we no longer exist. Right. So it's... It's a tough balance. I love it as they talk about, oh, well, we've got to get all the stakeholders around the table and talk about it. Okay, define stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And degree of stake. That's right. How much skin do you really have in the game? Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's incredible. We, we have a picture of Wayne Wonderland, my grandmother's school class, elementary class, as they were trying to get Capital Reef on the same status as Bryce Canyon. The early county commissioners and individuals could see what an economic engine Bryce Canyon was becoming for Garfield County. Capital Reef just never really did catch on to that degree. It's a different type of a park and it's developed completely different. Uh, so we've watched the evolution of Capitol Reef Park over the years. Keith Durfee that we mentioned earlier one day said, Paul, I have a picture I need to show you. And there was a large well, a sign about like that, and it was yellow paint, you couldn't see anything on it, but it was a, I, under, I remembered it knowing that it was a definition, a park boundary sign. And Keith had taken a picture of it and then as he changed the colors of it, all of a sudden you could see some writing. As he changed the colors, you could see writing. Oh, wow. And this was a statement. Park Service has denied my ability to trail sheep through here. There will be a problem. Vern Pace. Uh. My grandfather had written that on the sign. <laughs> I, I would like to have listened to the confrontation between <laughs> yes. the, the, the park superintendent and Vern Pace as they talked as to where he was historically trailed sheep and where wow. the park ranger wanted him to trail sheep. Wow. How interesting. So we've watched the expansion of Capitol Reef as, right. as LBJ created the first yeah. land grab of the presidential powers and it yeah. increased the size of it. We've, we've watched our neighbors suffer mm -hmm. under those conditions and Capitol Reef become, it cuts the county completely in two. Right. From the north boundary to the south boundary. You cannot go east from west to east without crossing Capitol Reef. Right. It's impossible. You, so there are, you don't have a utility corridor how do you get electricity through? It, it, it's a difficult thing. Yeah. And, and now, it, is it a problem getting good internet service through? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and yes. I've heard people say yes, that. Yes, uh, I'm uh, chairman of the board of the local phone cooperative. And uh, we struggle getting authorizations and right-of-ways for fiber optic. Right. which fuels all data transmission. There you go. And uh, we didn't have any problem at all getting the right of way into Capitol Reef because they needed it. Oh. <laughs> it was so a, did they lay fiber optic cable? There's a small fiber optic cable. The right of ways are in place and we will put in a, a significantly larger fiber cable clear to the visitor center. Oh. Will, will it sort of follow Highway 24? Yes, 
yes, as you look, there's there's a uh, the flags are in place. You can soon pick out where they, and it's right next to where the buried phone cable is now. It's already nice. been disrupted, but it didn't take the park very long to to get the right of way in place <laughs> they when, it, when they needed it. Now, will it have to stop there? Oh, absolutely. Oh, so the people on the east side. Oh right. no, no, we couldn't know. So because it really isn't that far to go, because the park is only a, what? It's pretty narrow. In, yeah, exactly. Yes. And there's already power line through it. Right. All the way. Right. Right. Well, that is an interesting question. As to the uh, why there, yes. Yeah. Yes. Most environmentalists already have their cabin in the hills. That's why they want to shut it down so exactly. nobody else can have theirs. Exactly. And, uh, uh, Forgive me for that, but yeah, it's it's a little sore spot. No, that's a good thing to express how you feel it's, and your it's, experience. It's hard and it's difficult. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm what? You went to high school here? Yeah. She. To Wayne High. I huh? did. Because you came when you were 14. Correct. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. And so a lot of this has been formed for sure. many years in your experience. So. It has. My class, my graduating class, was much smaller. It was 30 kids. Isn't that so? And it, you know, yeah. waxes and wanes, it's interesting. If you look historically at the population of Wayne County, it, it never goes above 2,200 people. Hmm. 2,200. That's a small. Yeah, and then group. you think about how huge Wayne County is, Boulder Mountain top, top of Boulder is the same size as the state of Delaware. Wow. It's, it's, people in the East don't even fathom, yeah. you know, what it's like to live out in the West. The stretches of land. <clears throat> exactly. Our, our middle son graduated with 43 in his class, so it mm -hmm. definitely, but, mm -hmm. but typically, well, right now, you know, you hear a lot of the news right now about Garfield County and their schools and even in Escalante, Escalante, whatever you want to call it, Escalante to us. <laughs> their schools are getting smaller and smaller. Well, they are here, too. Wow. Our high school is down about 35, 40 kids, our elementary Total? Is down. Total? Yes. The whole high school? The whole high school. No, it, it's, re we have more than 35 kids. That's, that's, that's a reduction. Down. That's the reduction Normally in one Normally they year. have about oh, 170, oh, I see. I and see. they're at about 140. Oh, so and same with the elementary 35. school. They normally have about that's 170, okay. and they're about 130. So, do you think that's because people are having smaller families? I think now? that's one of the factors. I think people are finding it harder and harder to stay here and make a living. Right. They have to leave. Um, Aspen closing took a lot of families that was from our community. A hard hit. It wasn't was. It? There were three programs and there were 250 employees. And when you talk about not only here, but there were about 50 people coming from Sevier County a mm -hmm. day to work over here mm -hmm. at those programs. So that was a huge hit. Mm -hmm. So that, that hurt our county, it did. Yeah. The timber industry has disappeared. Mm -hmm. Right. When we got married and moved to Bicknell, there were five um, sawmills in this town. And now there's one and it, it works about once a month on a Saturday. Wow. People wow. just, you know, the environmental community has shut timber down to mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yet on your way here today, I'm sure you passed the big fire by Monroe. Where yes. they're having to, what they, what, it's a control burn. Control burn. They're having to burn out some of that dense vegetation because they're not allowed to cut the timber. Okay. It becomes dangerous. Okay. So they, the Forest Service has to burn it out. I see. I see. You know, yeah. I'm, and I'm hearing that those aren't even trees that logging companies want. Mm -hmm. that these are just mm -hmm. fir trees that aren't even. Kind of a low timber. growth, yes. maybe a yeah. dense low grade growth. timber. Mm -hmm. Low grade, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so uh, seen... Is there much mining anymore in the county? You know, mining's always been a boom or bust. Uranium right. was a product that right. they were after. Right. Uh, some of the very first uranium that they that they refined actually came oh. right out of Capitol Reef. Interesting. Uh, the richest uranium find was the Pix mine on the Muddy River. Oh, is that right? They located that by hanging a Geiger counter out of an airplane and getting the reed. 
Really? Uh, the gentleman came to the valley and contacted my father, who still had uh, pack saddles and horses and mules from the days of, of the sheep herd. Wow. And wanted dad to, to take his equipment, take him into that place so they could uh, locate the, uh, the claims, take the claims. And dad said, I, I, I can't do it. I'm just starting to cut first crop hay. Mm -hmm. And Pick said, I'll, I'll pay. And dad says, I know you will, but I can't leave a crop in the field. Did you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they, he found someone else and they located that, that particular uranium vein, yielded a lot of uranium. The Hunt brothers bought him out and the vein played out about six months later. Oh, wow. Interesting story for another time, but the Lichtenhorn uh, Mining Company then came to my father six weeks later. Well, he got the, the crop was up and they contracted him and he took them off into the canyons and they located a lot of uranium. Now, whereabouts is that? Well, he was working actually towards the drainages into the Escalante River, Silver Reef and uh, the Rainbow Reef mine. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, they so uh, the Burr Trail. Okay, yeah. Uh, south of the Burr Trail, mm -hmm. from there down to the shores of the Colorado, down to Lake Powell. So that that's was, rough country. That's an incredibly rough country. Uh, they got ledged up one time, and they could see a trail underneath them, and they looked around. And there were two men. My dad was fairly small. And little Willard Brinkerhoff was even smaller, but they decided he was too old. And so they tied their lariats together and lowered my dad over the ledge down to the trail. And then he followed it out and rimmed it out to where then they could get off of that particular spot. Oh. So adventures goodness. like that we grew up Whoa. with. That's, that sounds like the hole in the rock expedition. Yeah. Well, it was, it was close. It Very was in the vicinity similar, there. Huh? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I grew up uh, handling locoed cattle. Mm -hmm. They would get into the local weed uh, in the springtime, especially. Mm. You learn to handle those cattle from a distance. If you got close to them, they, they would attack you. But you could move back and, and handle those cattle. Is it fatal? Yes. That? The first thing that happens, they abort their calves, they lose their calves, and then, then it is fi it's fatal, and they go crazy. Uh, they'll see a little crack in the, in the ground, and they'll jump over it like it was a Grand Canyon. Uh, hallucinogenic. Yeah. It is a hallucinogenic. It must be. Something. Yeah, that makes it's sense. A, it's, a, yeah. Makes... it's an end to fight relationship with the local weed, and so I, I grew up handling those those kinds of cattle. Sure. There was, uh, and those cattle, we some of them, you don't gather every year, so a cow might not see a human for a couple of years. And then you gather her, and she, uh, they're on the fight. Uh, we rode into the corral, and uh, I, the cow came right at my father, and, and mm. he, was, he moved aside. But then that cow went by him and then went underneath my oldest brother's horse. Mm. And that dad says, that's it. We'll, we'll, we've got to get her out of this corral. We've got to handle her. So dad roped her and Jeff healed her, stretched her out, put her down. And uh, he said, now, Paul, you take your shaps and spurs off. You're going to have to run. And I says, okay. It's, I knew better than to ask why. I, it was all going to play out. And, uh, he said, and then my next brother, David, he said, David will open and close the gate on the truck. So the cow stretched out in the corral. Because you had to transport her somewhere. Yes, you had to take her to the auction so she can go to work for McDonald's. Oh. <laughs> and... Uh, and she had to be transported out on the hoof. Right, yes. Alive. Alive. And she's on the fight, and she, her objective is to kill you. Mm. Not just hit you, but, but a cow that wants to kill you will push and then stand on you. Then will push down. It's interesting to see if they're angry, they just want to butt you out of the way, or if they actually want to kill you. 
Oh, my goodness. There's a difference in how they will attack you. Just an instinctive behavior. Yes. And you, and you see that transition in them. You can about see it in their eye as to what, what they're going to do. So Dad said, I, you run by her and slap her with your hat so that she knows, so she'll be after you. You had to do that? Yeah, and Dad said, Jeff and I will let go of the ropes and she will come up and you run into the crowd and alley and towards the load and shoot, you go through the truck and up over in the camp rack and she'll follow you in there and David will close the gate. You were the bait. <laughs> right. <laughs> Youngest guy. Youngest guy, fleetest of foot. Oh, my gosh. And How old were you then? I would probably have been 12. Oh, gosh. And so we did just what Dad said. Mm. And I had to laugh as I went to work for the Farm Service Agency. They sent me to training to know how to deal with stress. <laughs> I'd grown up with so much stress. For example, when this old cow chased me, that was stress when you uh -huh. could put your hand behind you and she was blowing snot in the palm of your hand. Oh, <laughs> gosh. So I ran by her. Dad turned her, Jeff and Dad turned her loose. Up she came. It worked just like he said. I went in the truck, up over, David closed the gate, and the cow was loaded. Oh, how did your dad know you could outrun the cow? He didn't turn... Uh, he wouldn't have turned her loose until I had a good enough head start. Sounds like she was pretty close to you. Oh, well, I had to get close enough to her that she would come after me and not the other horses. Mm. And mm. so I had to tantalize her to the point that she wanted me. It's a good thing you're sure-footed. Well, it, it all had to happen. It had to, oh, yes. So, she had prayer that morning, right? <laughs> yeah. oh, so those were some experiences that we've had. Mm-hmm. Tell her about the mine on the Henry's currently. There is a mining operation currently on the oh. Henry Mountains. Yes. What are they mining? Should we Gold. turn the light on? Is it getting a little dark in here? Uh, maybe that'd be good. Like this one? Is that? Oh, we're on the wall. Okay. First, the very first one. In the bromide basin, a, a company yeah. from uh, South Africa. Oh, really? Mining gold, actively mining, actively... In the Henry's? In the Henry's. Oh, my goodness. Up in what they call the Bromide Basin. The first gold was brought out of there. I have no idea if the Spaniards did it, but in the Roaring Twenties, there was a mill, and they moved a lot of gold out of that part of the mountain. I and have no still, idea. Yeah, they're still mining there. Wow. Incredible histories. So they must be making it profitable. Well, there's always more money in selling wheelbarrows and shovels <laughs> than gold. And I don't know if they're promoting and have a lot of outside money come in uh -huh. or if they're actually moving gold. And maybe the price of gold is high enough now right. that it's profitable. And if it were to drop, then well, they might I, not. I should show her the old mail pouch that we have. Tell her about the rabbi that comes in. <laughs> oh, no. I, oh, tell me about the rabbi that comes they in. They have a rabbi come in and bless the operation. They fly Seriously? him in. Seriously? Yes, they fly him in from Jerusalem. You're kidding. No, no. And uh, so this is a Jewish... A Jewish company. It's Jewish money. That's out of South Africa. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it, that's an interesting story. I didn't know there were many Jewish companies in South Africa. Yeah, I know there's there a lot of gold now. mining. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Isn't that great? great that story. is great. But but we have in our possession the, the mail pouch that Stu Wiley carried mail from Hanksville to Eagle City to Height and back. So where was where is Eagle City? Eagle know. City is on the Henry Mountains. It's below this current mining operation about five or six miles. It was a roaring... On the east face. Mining oh, okay. town. Directly east. In the 20s. Uh, Stu Wiley carried that mail. Wow. Stu Wiley... On horseback. On horseback. Yeah. And uh, what were they mining for? Gold. The same. The same. My goodness. So there was an old gentleman by the name of Billy Hay. 
Billy Hay was a, he maintained he was an Irishman. I love this story. And they'd say, Billy, you're not an Irishman. You was born in Chicago. <laughs> and he'd say, now, fellas, let me ask you this question. He said, if, if the cat has kittens in the oven, do you call them biscuits? <laughs> and they said, well, we can't even argue with that, Billy. If you want to be an Irishman, okay, you be an Irishman. He was a colorful old character that lived in Hanksville, it worked for my granddad, and granddad said he would stay with you until the spring when you really needed him. <laughs> then he'd take the wages he'd made all winter and go to prospecting for gold, and he'd just be gone oh, one morning. Oh, seriously? Yeah, so that that's how Billy Hay... He came to the bishop in Hanksville and said, Bishop, uh, when I die, can I get buried in the cemetery there? And the bishop said, well, sure, Billy, you're one of us. Uh, sure, we'll bury you there, but are you thinking about that? No, no. But he said, well, why are you asking that? He said, well, Bishop, in a Mormon cemetery is the last place a devil's going to look for a Catholic Irishman. <laughs> I love that story. And Billy Hayes buried in the Hanksville Cemetery. <laughs> really? Yes. Now, what year would he have passed to approximately? Oh, wow. But well, any, I'm just whatever to... I say would be wrong. Oh, I was trying 40s. to get an idea. In the 40s, okay, early 40s okay. is when he So died. the time that he was around was like 30s. Or... Yes. Okay. Yes. Was... So interesting. His granddad was putting that together. I. So the gentleman that we talked about that carried the mail, Stu Wiley, Stu was the last, I think he was the last World War I veteran. Oh, wow. In this valley. Oh, my goodness. And I asked Stu one day, I said, Stu, did you know Billy Hay? He said, oh, I did. I knew Billy Hay was my friend. And then he told me a story that was incredible. Hmm. He said that as Billy was dying, he turned to Stu and said, I'd like to be buried in some green plaid socks. <laughs> in Hanksville, Utah, you just well ordered <laughs> gold slippers, you know? <laughs> and Stu thought about it, and Billy Hay died shortly thereafter. And Stu said, I'm going to Green River mm -hmm. to get the socks. And they said, well, Stu, you've got 24 hours get right. back here. It's hot in Hanksville. You yes, know. <laughs> there's no embalming. That's right. And we're going to have to put Billy in the ground. Yeah. So this story Stu Wiley told me, Stu left Hanksville on a horse and leading a horse. Went as hard and as fast as he dared go, got to a water hole out there, got off the horse he was riding, hobbled the horse, got on the other one, and went into Green River. Mm. Stu says I got him his socks. He didn't tell me if they were green plaid or green wool <laughs> socks. He just said I got him his socks. <laughs> so he borrowed a horse from Green River and did the same sequence, rode that horse as hard as he dared, and then when he unsaddled that horse, it went back to Green River. Oh, wow. Then he came on with the horse that was fairly fresh and got to his horse that he'd left hobbled that was fresh and rode on into Hanksville and the other horse come along two or three days and he got there in time to put the socks on Billy Hay. Oh, that was a good friend. Billy Hay died a rich man to have a friend like that, don't you think? Yes. Yeah, as Stu Wiley told me that story. That's amazing. And so I was quite intrigued with oral history. Yes. And uh, sure. some of these I should have written down. Should I tell them the story that got me yes. interested in, in yes. oral history? Sure. Yeah. Liz, heard the, here's these stories so often, I'm sorry. <laughs> he used to do um, a, a talk for Dixie State College oh, called great. Ranching with Father. Oh, that's and they would bring great. in the elder hostel group that cleans the trails and does things like that for the park. And then he would go down and entertain them for an hour with these Fabulous. Factual stories. Fabulous. Yeah. That is great. And they had, this group got a new director, and her world is very structured. Uh. And she said, I can't have you giving a lecture to some groups and not others. 
So you're either going to have to give it to all of them or none. And I says, you just made it so easy on me because I can't do it. So right, right. our relationship 